When scary mysteries go unsolved, CCTV video footage can provide detectives with important evidence, and that's especially true with missing people cases. Investigators can use a missing person's final moments to determine the direction they were last heading, who else was in the area, and to appeal to the public for more case information. And yet, sometimes, even this detailed information is still not enough for these unsolved mysteries to finally be solved. Number 5 Michael Modesti was a tiler in Adelaide, Australia when he went missing in 2016 after returning from a work trip in Thailand. He spent the weekend of May 6th relaxing with his girlfriend and son. In the early afternoon of May 8th, he dropped his son off and went back to his empty house. That evening, he ordered a pizza, then called his girlfriend as usual. Nobody who saw Michael that day reported anything out of the ordinary about him. They never could have expected the strange mystery that was to follow. Michael's girlfriend was the first to worry when he didn't contact her at all the following day. The rest of his family hadn't heard from him either. The following day, Michael was reported as a missing person. Michael's home was found empty, the front door locked, and his car missing. Police detectives could not rule out force, although there was no sign of a home disturbance. There were dishes in the sink, the TV was still on, and his phone and wallet were found inside. His family couldn't think of any reason why he would want to mysteriously disappear so suddenly. On May 11th, Michael's brother found his abandoned car in West Croydon on the corner of Chinoweth Avenue. There was a hydroponic farm nearby the area where Michael's car was found. At first, police theorized that he may have gone to check on the crops and ran into trouble, but searches of the area turned up no new clues. Michael was nowhere to be found. Investigators then returned to the public to figure out why Michael was driving down Chinoweth Road. The neighborhood was mostly residential, with young families living on the street where Michael's car was found. Some neighbors reported seeing the car in the area before, but none knew why Michael had been visiting on the day he went missing. Investigators turned to video evidence to piece together a timeline of events. A pedestrian reported seeing the vehicle parked on Chenoweth Road at 5.30 a.m. on May 9th. However, dash cam footage obtained from a taxi showed the car was not parked there at 3.15 a.m. Police suspected the disappearance had taken place sometime between 5.30 that morning and the night before. Upon further investigation, detectives soon discovered that Michael may have had more involvement with criminal dealings than it first seemed. Michael had told his family that his trip to Thailand had been to go to a building expo that was taking place in Bangkok. He was looking at importing silicon, which was cheap in Thailand and suitable for using in his tile business or to sell at a profit. But police couldn't determine if Michael had actually gone to the expo or if this was a cover story. What they did know was that he traveled to Pattaya, a city known for its nightlife, according to the country's tourism board, which often involved black market activities. Strangely, Michael hadn't meant to go on the trip alone. Another man who had a similar business to Michael had also intended to go. This unnamed man pulled out at the last moment. When police looked deeper, they found this person was living an extravagant lifestyle that he shouldn't have been able to afford doing trade work at all. Going to Pattaya with an associate to extravagantly spend money wouldn't have been too suspicious except Michael and this associate had been to Thailand many times before. Police believed Michael was looking at importing something completely different to silicon from Thailand, and far less legal. CCTV images were released to the public. One was from a few days before Michael went missing as he left the airport. He was seen walking out, looking around at the front of the airport, then going back inside. It was speculated he may have been looking for someone. More CCTV footage would soon change the timeline on the day Michael went missing. Police now believed he left his home much later on that morning. A home security camera video showed a car similar to Michael's blue Mitsubishi Magna at 9.20 a.m. A video taken on Chinoweth Avenue 10 minutes later showed Michael's car was not there. 
Finally, a third piece of creepy CCTV footage released to the public came from a bus driving past the end of the street just after 10.30 a.m. It had just stopped at a nearby stand to let a woman off. They continued in the same direction, then the woman turned down Chenoweth Avenue. The footage showed the woman walking past the car, which was now parked at the end of the street. Investigators found this evidence puzzling. The news CCTV footage meant the witness who had placed the car at 5.30 that morning had been mistaken, or the car had been on that street twice that morning. Police now believe Michael left his home sometime after 8 a.m. He was either with the person responsible for his mysterious disappearance or was on his way to meet them. Investigators trying to solve this scary mystery hit another stumbling block when it came to the car itself. The family had reported it to police as soon as they found it, but before police could get there, someone had tampered with the evidence. Michael had had a burner phone which police believed he had used for illegal activities. This would explain why Michael had left his personal phone at home, but an unidentified individual had taken the phone from the car and dropped it down a drain. It's not clear if this had been in an effort to protect Michael from any criminal convictions or to protect the person Michael had been going to meet, but police were unable to find the phone and lost a valuable piece of evidence. If any other evidence was found from the car, it hasn't been revealed to the public. Police believe they know the person responsible for Michael's unsolved disappearance, but need more evidence in order to say for certain if he is guilty. Michael has never been found. A reward of $2,000 has been offered for information that could help solve this scary mystery or return Michael to his loved ones. Police hope as time goes on, the people with the information they need to crack the case will feel safe enough to come forward. Number 4 Stephen Mackerel was a 25-year-old father of one when he vanished in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The unsolved disappearance went from what at first seemed to be a simple missing person case to possibly being something more after creepy CCTV footage of the missing man was found. Stephen was a professional poker dealer in 2015 and the father to a one-year-old daughter. His family say he completely adored her and would never leave without contacting his family. It was the end of July when Stephen was last seen. He spent most of July 29th fishing with a cousin and slept for a while in the boat while they were out on one of the many lakes in the area. That evening, he had a couple of friends and went to a local hangout called Lucky's Tavern for drinks. In the early hours of the following morning, the group went to a nearby condo with a few young women. It was here where Stephen's loved ones saw him for the last time. For some reason, Stephen got into his car and went to go meet some other friends. He had consumed at least five drinks at this point and despite being over the limit, drove 25 minutes north to an unknown destination which none of his family can really explain. The friends he was supposed to meet weren't anywhere near there. Around 2.30 a.m., Stephen was caught on CCTV video at a gas station in Pompano Beach. He wandered through the aisles inside the shop, getting snacks and occasionally bumping into things. About 20 minutes later, surveillance video caught Stephen interacting with a man in another car in the parking lot. This man was in the passenger seat of the car. According to police, they'd gotten into an altercation. As the other car drove off, Stephen threw a can at the car. The car then went around the pumps, waiting for Stephen to leave and following him out. These two clips were released by police to the public. It's not clear what, if anything, was caught on camera during the moments between the two CCTV videos, which only makes this unsolved case even more mysterious. What happened after Stephen left the gas station remains a total mystery. He didn't make it to any friends or back home. Neither Stephen nor his car, a missing white 2013 Ford Fusion, have been found since. His family quickly realized something was wrong the following day. When they couldn't solve his disappearance on their own, they contacted police. Other than the CCTV evidence, Investigators have found very few clues to explain what might have happened to Stephen. There were plenty of other places in the area with CCTV cameras, but Stephen's car was never caught on video again. 
His license plate also wasn't read by any automated reader on the night that he vanished. Police know what direction Stephen was heading when he left the gas station, but the destination isn't known. In the weeks after he was first reported missing, police and the family made many appeals to try to get to the bottom of this scary mystery. They received hundreds of tips from the public in response, which police have worked through, but none have turned up any clues. The family also hired a private investigator at one point. Many missing person cases have been solved with the help of private investigators, as the local police force might not have the time to follow up on every lead. But in this case, the investigator didn't seem to do much and brought the family no closer to solving the case. There are three distinct possibilities about what happened to Stephen. The first explanation, though unlikely, is that he disappeared of his own free will. However, he had no reason to want to disappear, and there's been no cell phone or bank activity in the years since Stephen mysteriously vanished. The Sun Pass on his car windshield, which is a travel pass for toll roads in Florida, also hadn't been used since before the night of his disappearance. Early in the investigation, it was speculated that he might have had something to do with a hit and run in which a pickup truck had fled less than an hour after he was last seen. But that theory doesn't appear to have lasted long. Even if he had gotten into trouble, it's unlikely he would have abandoned his close-knit family without at least explaining his disappearance to them first. The other two scenarios to explain this unsolved case are either accidental circumstances or foul play police haven't been able to rule out either. Police released an image of the unknown suspect Stephen had been arguing with. Getting witness statements from everyone in this car was a top priority in this criminal investigation. Police were uncertain of their role in Stephen's mysterious disappearance. They could have been trying to scare him and then parted ways. Even if they were not directly involved in the disappearance, they could still provide valuable information about where Stephen was last seen. Stephen's family believe these people may have something to do with this scary mystery, with the fight possibly escalating until something serious happened. It's unknown if these people have ever been found and interviewed. If they were, then their testimony has never been made public. It's possible Stephen was the victim of foul play from some other party that was never captured on CCTV. It's never been properly understood why Stephen drove into the area. The most likely explanation seems to be that he'd gotten lost from Lucky's Tavern. But it's still possible that he went to meet someone unknown to the family and met an unexpected ending. The third and most likely explanation to this mystery is that he had an accident. There were many waterways in the area where Stephen disappeared, including a number of lakes he would have driven past to get home. Some had only short barriers between the road and the water, while others had a number of boat ramps. Many of these lakes and other waterways have been searched by police and voluntary organizations, such as Adventures with Purpose. While a number of missing cars have been found in lakes and elsewhere, none have been a match to Stephen's car. This doesn't necessarily mean Stephen's car isn't in the water, which is surprisingly deep in many places around the Pompano Beach area. Every year, Stephen's family continue to appeal for information that could help bring him home and solve this scary mystery. Stephen is described as being 5'10 and weighing 162 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He was wearing a short-sleeved t-shirt with a circular design on the front, khaki pants and black shoes. His car was a white four-door 2013 Ford Fusion with the license plate number WJ70L and one rim in a different color than the others. Anyone with information that could help solve this strange and mysterious disappearance can contact Broward County Crime Stoppers at 954-493-TIPS. Number 3 June of 2012 was a time of celebration for many people in the UK. Many people had off from work and were celebrating the Queen's Diamond Jubilee with friends and family. For Claire Holland, it was the beginning of a scary mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Claire was 32 years old in 2012. She had recently reconnected with her family and moved into a new flat to be near them in Bristol. She also had a child who she adored. Claire was excited and busy. 
she had been buying new furniture that would arrive at her new apartment in a few months. She also had several meetings set up. On Wednesday, June 6th, Claire spent the day in Broadmead, Bristol's shopping quarter. According to Claire's family, she loved shopping and spent much of the day purchasing clothes and browsing the shops, which would later provide investigators with evidence for her missing person case. Several CCTV cameras caught Claire going about her day. She was alone in the footage, though it was a relatively busy afternoon and many people would have walked past. The final piece of CCTV footage showed a mysterious event at around 9.30 p.m when Claire entered the Seamus O'Donnell's pub. It was Claire's favorite pub and she was relatively well known there. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary for Claire to stop in, especially at a time when there was a lot to celebrate. Staff at the pub remembered Claire leaving shortly after closing time at 11.15 p.m. What happened after that remains an unsolved mystery. It was a few days before anybody realized Claire was a missing person. It's not clear why it took so long, but eventually her friends and family realized something strange was going on. Claire used Facebook frequently to stay in touch with friends and family. Her social media silence since June 6th was noticed by many. When her family began asking around, they realized nobody had spoken to her since that night either. She had gone missing from all of her appointments and had also missed numerous home deliveries at times that she had scheduled. It was as if she had disappeared into thin air. Ten days after Claire mysteriously vanished, she was reported missing to the police. At first, police weren't sure what to make of her sudden disappearance. She had no known reason to want to go missing, and by all accounts was looking forward to her new life. But it's not always possible to explain what's going on inside a person's own head. Was it possible Claire hadn't been enjoying her life as much as her friends and family thought? That seemed a slim possibility, especially when police realized her bank account hadn't been touched since the night she disappeared. Whatever had happened to her, it was very out of character. There was plenty of street cam footage of Claire going about her day. However, investigators were puzzled by the lack of footage after she left the pub. There were a lot of cameras in the area, as evidenced by the large number of videos of Claire from earlier and police clearly got to the cameras before they were automatically wiped, as even the earlier footage was obtained. So whatever happened to Claire seems to have happened very shortly after she went to Seamus O'Donnell's. There also doesn't seem to be any camera footage from inside the pub itself. That left police with a lot of questions about what went on inside the pub and where she intended to go after she left. Even though she had been alone throughout the day, it's possible she didn't intend to stay alone that evening. According to her mother, she had gone to meet someone who has never been identified to speak about an unknown topic. Investigators cannot determine if Claire disappeared before she reached this meeting or if this event had nothing to do with her unsolved case. Knowing more about this could provide valuable information about her last moments before vanishing into thin air. Police sent information to everyone on Claire's Facebook friends list, asking for any information to help them develop a timeline. A similar appeal for information was made on the police website. Hundreds of leads were followed up, but all led police no closer to figuring out what happened that June night. After the initial push for information, the case seemingly went cold and didn't get much publicity. Claire would appear on lists of local missing people who hadn't been found, but there wasn't much progress in the case and little coverage besides those lists. Police didn't believe this strange mystery was the result of foul play until years later in 2019. The exact details of this investigation are unclear, but in 2019, police told Claire's family that they had arrested a man in connection to this unsolved mystery. He was released soon after. This activity seemed to reopen the investigation, and there was lots of more movement in the unsolved case over the next few years, including multiple searches of the area around where Claire disappeared. The site isn't too far away from various waterways, including docks and professional divers were sent to look for clues. In 2012, another pub was forensically examined by police though they emphasized that none of the tenants at the pub were believed to be involved. 
Despite the extensive searches, Claire still hasn't been found. Around the time of the 10th anniversary of Claire's disappearance, police again arrested the man that they had detained three years earlier. This time, he was charged in her disappearance, but still awaits trial. Police have continued to appeal for information that could help solve this strange mystery. Claire was five feet tall and of a slim build when she vanished. She was wearing black pants, a short-sleeved black top, and a gray t-shirt underneath. Anyone with information is asked to contact Crime Stoppers or the local police. Number 2. A strange and mysterious unsolved missing person case began in the town of New Kwai on December 19th, the weekend before Christmas in 2015. Among the last-minute Christmas shoppers out that afternoon was Chad Gibson. Chad was 32 years old at the time and a loving father to a little girl from a relationship that ended on good terms years ago. He lived in St. Estelle in Cornwall with Sharon, his mother, who was from London. He was looking forward to moving into an apartment to be closer to his daughter. Shortly before he vanished, he had told his mother about a young woman that he had met at a bar. Chad's mother explained that he wasn't the type of person to date lots of different women. So when he told her about this woman and said he really liked her, it stood out. He had also recently changed his plans for Christmas. He and his mother were both supposed to go to London to spend Christmas with Chad's sister until he told Sharon that he wanted to stay in Cornwall. He said he just didn't feel like going to London and didn't give her more of an explanation. Sharon thought this was odd but didn't think too much of it. It was the beginning of a strange and scary mystery. On the morning of December 19th, Chad left his home at about 11 a.m. He told his mother he was going out in St. Estelle. He didn't come home that day or the next. Sharon grew worried but thought that he had likely stayed with friends. When he didn't send her a message on Christmas morning though, she knew something strange had happened. She couldn't reach him by phone and nobody else had seen or heard from Chad since December 19th. He hadn't even called to say Merry Christmas to his daughter. Sharon returned to St. Austell the day after Christmas and began the search for her missing son. At first, the investigation focused on St. Austell, where Chad was last known to be seen. Sharon made a media appeal for information or for Chad to let them know that he was safe. It was only after a friend contacted people on social media that his family realized he'd actually been in New Kwai. Chad had spent the early afternoon of December 19th in St. Estelle, but moved on to New Kwai later in the day. He had met a friend in a local pub called The Central. The friend had been at a work party when he bumped into Chad. As they were catching up, Chad told his friend about the woman that he had met. The conversation was overheard by another man at the bar, and it was somebody neither Chad nor his friend knew. According to the man, she was taken, and he didn't appreciate Chad trying to get into a relationship with her. Chad said he was unaware of this and didn't want any trouble. Despite this, the man followed Chad into the bathroom and continued the argument. His friends soon joined. At some point, one member of the group decided to take Chad's picture. Chad left not much later and he was caught on camera along with the two other men who were walking just in front of him. Later, CCTV footage showed him walking alone across a mini roundabout. These moments were the last time Chad was seen. This evidence changed the investigation in a number of ways. Not only did this mean Chad's last sighting was in a different town, but it changed the case from a simple missing person case to a potentially much scarier mystery. Chad's friends and family weren't convinced his unsolved disappearance had been a priority for police up until that point. He had just been another young man out partying during the holiday season. Now, they weren't so sure. The creepy CCTV footage was released to the media, and the police wanted to identify the people in the video with Chad. At the time, they weren't being treated as suspects, but could give police clues as to where Chad intended to go after leaving the pub. CCTV from the surrounding area was searched, but no other traces of Chad could be found. Whatever happened to him likely happened very close to the pub. As with many missing person cases, CCTV gave police a starting point. But after that, it seems the case has gone cold. Chad's friends and family believe someone in the area know what happened to him and could help solve this unsolved mystery. 
It was still relatively late in the evening when Chad went missing. People were still going about their daily routines. Even if foul play wasn't involved in his disappearance, there's likely a witness who could bring Chad's unsolved case closer to getting solved. Anyone at the pub on that day is a criminal suspect. The woman Chad had been interested in has been identified, though her name has not been made public. It's also not known how much both she and her angry boyfriend have been involved in the investigation. While taking a photo of Chad does seem creepy, there are less disturbing reasons this might have been done. It could simply have been used to confront the girlfriend, but some have theorized the photo would be used for others to identify Chad later that night. There are other possible answers for this strange mystery though. Nuque is a seaside town and the coastline wasn't too far from where Chad was last seen. It was theorized by police that he may have gone over a cliff for reasons unknown. Chad's friends and family believe he had no reason to do something like this intentionally. He was looking forward to the new year. An accident is the more likely explanation, as it had been raining and he could have lost his balance. If Chad had plunged into the sea, then this mystery may never be truly solved. Over the years, a number of remains have been found in the New Quay area, and DNA has been tested, but none have been Chad. Sharon continued to appeal for information, but it didn't get any answers to this mystery before she passed away. The rest of Chad's family continue to search for answers. Chad is described as six foot two with black hair and a goatee at the time of his mysterious disappearance. He had a tattoo of the word A-N-N-A-I on his neck and a scar from his right wrist to his elbow. He was wearing a sky blue hooded top and dark jeans when he vanished. Anyone with information should contact Crime Stoppers at 0800-555-111. Number 1. Deirdre Jacob was only a few yards from her front door when she strangely vanished without a trace in a scary unsolved mystery that has remained unexplained for more than 20 years. Despite its age, CCTV footage of Deirdre on the day of her mysterious disappearance has been used by police to try to solve the case. Deirdre was 18 years old in 1998. She was born and raised in the small Irish town of Newbridge, County Kildare, but had decided to go to university in London. That summer, she had just finished her first year studying to become a primary school teacher. She had come back to Newbridge for the summer break and spent time catching up with friends and family back home. She stayed with her parents and younger sister at the family home, a 25-minute walk from Newbridge town centre. By the end of July, Deirdre had made preparations for the start of a new school year. The weekend before she vanished, she met up with friends from university at Carrick Macross, which was roughly a two-hour drive from Newbridge. A few days later, she would disappear. It was Tuesday, July 28th, when Deirdre was last seen running errands around town. She visited her grandmother's store and kept her company for a while, before going to the bank for a teller's check. She then went to the post office to send the teller's check to her friend back in London, so her friend could secure their housing for the upcoming school year. After her errands were done, she stopped in with her grandmother again before beginning the walk home. These movements were caught on multiple CCTV cameras across the town center. She was seen walking alone with her black messenger bag. Witnesses could attest to multiple sightings of the missing person during her walk as many people in Newbridge knew Deirdre. She had lived there almost her entire life and was well regarded. The final sighting of Deirdre wasn't by someone who knew her personally. A motorist driving past Deirdre's home at around 3 p.m. spotted a woman matching the description in her missing person report and carrying the same black messenger bag with the yellow cat logo on it. She was standing at the end of her driveway outside the gate. Under normal circumstances, she would have been moments away from being safe inside, but Deirdre never made it inside. Her parents got home from work at about 7 p.m. and realized Deirdre was missing from home. It was extremely out of character for her to not be where she said she was going to be. They contacted Deirdre's friends to see if she was with them for some reason, but soon it became clear that she was nowhere to be found. The strange mystery was reported to puzzled police. 
the investigation into her baffling disappearance began immediately. By July 31st, the case went national, with a widespread appeal for information and a large-scale search of the countryside. Using CCTV footage and witness interviews, police established a timeline of Deirdre's day up until the moments she was seen at her gate. The events after that remained a mystery. The investigation focused on Newbridge and the surrounding area. But on September 28th, a tip from an anonymous man suggested that it might have been the wrong place entirely. The witness claimed to have seen Deirdre later than 3 p.m., hitchhiking well past her house. He drove her three miles away to Carrick Macross, the same town where she had met up with friends a few days earlier. She had seemed agitated, though he couldn't explain why. The man had been calling both police and Deirdre's parents in the weeks since her disappearance, but it seems only after he called into a radio show was his tip taken seriously. Deirdre's family began to hand out flyers in Carrick Macross and search for answers there. The police continued to appeal for the man to come forward, but he said he was helping as much as he could without saying who he was. Eventually, the police sent a recording of one phone conversation to the local news in the hopes that someone might be able to identify him. He was quickly identified, and the police determined that it had all been a hoax. The man had never been with Deirdre. The missing person case returned to Newbridge, but her family were still no closer to solving this dark mystery, and the case went cold for years. Investigators later determined that Deirdre became one of the missing people from Ireland's vanishing triangle. Including Deirdre, eight young women had disappeared in Eastern Ireland in the late 1990s. Some were the victims of attacks made by people they knew, but police believed at least some of the cases were connected. It was believed at least Deirdre and another young woman named Jojo Dullard were the victim of the same disturbing criminal. In 2000, it seemed police may have figured out who that criminal was. A man named Larry Murphy was arrested for unsuccessfully trying to take the life of another woman who survived when two hunters heard a commotion and intervened. He was jailed for the offense, and local police began to look at whether he may have been involved in any other unsolved cases. Later, his cellmate in prison would tell police that Murphy had made a shocking criminal confession about Deirdre's case. He claimed Murphy had stopped her at the side of the road and pretended to look for directions. While she was busy looking at a map in his hand, he had suddenly pulled her through the window and into the footwell of the passenger seat. This would have been a similar method of kidnapping to the one that he'd already been convicted of. The prisoner's story remained the same over the years, but Murphy would not give police any helpful information. The alleged criminal confession was kept secret and police looked into other ways to try to see if Murphy could be connected to the crime. Murphy had been a carpenter who may have been doing contract work in the Newbridge area at the time of Deirdre's disappearance. Stranger still, he could have done the work at the shop owned by Deirdre's grandmother in the past. Police contacted builders and other associates who would have worked with Murphy during the 1990s. Using an enhanced copy of the CCTV footage from the day of Deirdre's disappearance, they asked if the workers recognized anybody in the image. In particular, they were looking at a man who was standing outside the post office when Deirdre was visiting. Some of the men couldn't identify him, while others said he resembled Murphy. This was without any mention of Murphy by the police. Police searched the area where Murphy had committed the heinous crimes he was later found guilty of. They theorized that he could have taken Deirdre or any of the other missing women here during his darkest moments. No other clues that could help answer this unsolved mystery were found. In 2022, the Director of Public Prosecution was sent Deirdre's case file. Police hoped that the evidence might have been enough to bring the case against Murphy, but it was denied. For now, the mystery of what happened to Deirdre remains unsolved. Given how many witnesses saw Deirdre that day, it seems likely someone must have also seen the criminal responsible for her disappearance. Police have continued to appeal for information and hoped that now that time has passed, someone might have information that could help solve this strange mystery. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.